modeling and not in a uh, modeling and uh, not in microbiology. So <laughs> if I use uh, wrong terminology, so I apologize and then please interrupt me and ask if something is not uh, is not clear. Uh, so uh, why spatial modeling or how we can use spatial modeling? So pretty much any phenomena that we look in the world is somehow distributed in space or and with space I mean now landscape. Uh, so some kind of a spatial representation and the phenomena take and form different kind of clusters uh, there can be spatial variation in magnitude or size uh, of, a, of different phenomena and very rarely something is distributed uh, completely randomly i i teach geography here in university of helsinki and i and when talking about the spatial phenomena or spatial distribution so i always try to ask like if my students know some example of a completely randomly distributed phenomenon and the only thing i can think of if uh, is a uh, asteroid uh, uh, craters uh, the, like how they hit the earth but uh, yeah so we can use this uh, information of spatial distribution to find out uh, well first of all how the things are distributed but then also like what drives their distribution to try to understand the causal predictors of, uh, of uh, different phenomena and different spatial distributions. And just super simply, here are two photos from the same mountain, the one on the left from the north side and the one on the right from the, from the south side of the same mountain, or it's more of a hill uh, situated in northernmost of Finland. And we see that the vegetation looks pretty different. So there is a spatial variation in the distribution of the vegetation. And we can already think of some uh, ideas based on our ecological knowledge, like why there are some differences in the vegetation. For example, the less sun uh, on the northern side, the lower temperature uh, versus the warmer condition in a southern slope of, of the mountain, which might then affect the amount of uh, and the species uh, composition uh, of, the, of the vegetation. And uh, if we look in the more detail, so there is some fine scale variation in the topographic, uh, uh, in a mesotopographic uh, parameters, like uh, the little ridge here affecting possibly the moisture and, uh, and the little hollow here uh, collecting moisture and that way affecting uh, the, uh, that way affecting vegetation. But uh, so by combining the spatial distribution of different uh, factors, we can try to identify and think and uh, quantify different uh, relationships, be relationships between different factors and try to start understanding what drives different, uh, for example, ecological phenomena, for example, amount of vegetation or, or distribution of uh, soil microorganisms. And, uh, and um, when looking at these spatial relationships so a lot of it is based on what we already know like we know from ecological theory that uh, vegetation is affected by temperature precipitation or soil nutrients so when we use spatial modeling to look at these spatial uh, relationships we can in more detail quantify the relationships to identify uh, the most influential predictors or, or, I, or compare the relative influence of different predictors. Uh, we can also look at in more detail the, the nature of relationships, whether they are positive or negative or some kind of a hump shape. And then once we have quantified these relationships or these relationships, we can uh, forecast the distribution in space or in time. And uh, this is what uh, the, in nutshell, what we can do with the, with the spatial model. And here are just uh, very few examples of, uh, of what, one, what one can get out from the spatial modeling uh, or different type of spatial modeling. Uh, I know that I still haven't explained uh, uh, I still haven't explained uh, what, uh, how spatial modeling actually work or how SDMs work, but uh, that will come in short. But what we can get out from spatial modeling is, for example, compare relative influence of different predictors or different underlying factors. Here on the left, uh, this is from a study uh, assessing the drivers of plant species richness. And uh, according to this study, study in this study area in Arctic uh, environment, uh, temperature, winter temperature is the most influential driver of, uh, of uh, plant species richness. <clears throat> 
whereas topographic, for example, is the least. And we can in more uh, detail also assess the nature of the relationship. In this case, for example, the cover of Empetrum, the most dominant species in Finnish Lapland in northernmost uh, Finland, uh, it has a negative relationship with the plant species richness. Uh, if we do spatial models, different kinds of spatial models for different species groups, so we can, for example, compare uh, compare uh, how different drivers, or we can compare the effect of different drivers among different species groups. For example, here, that for bri bryophyte species richness, the mo it is best explained by summer temperature, whereas uh, vascular plant species is best explained by precipitation, the amount of uh, moisture among these, uh, these predictors that we tested here. And uh, uh, one more thing, something like a plenty of this, what we see from the spatial modeling is something that we already know from the ecological theory, but by using the spatial models, we can get more detailed understanding and quantify it, even get some kind of a numbers out. And here on the right now is uh, just a kind of a 3D plot showing the statistical interactions among uh, different predictors. Here on the z-axis, on the vertical axis, is a number of species, in this case vascular plants. And on the x and y axis, we have uh, summer temperature, and, or the representation of summer temperature, and the cover of empetrum. And uh, we can, according to this model, we identified that there is a statistical interaction between empetrum and growing decree days, meaning that the effect of growing decree days on species richness depends on the amount of uh, empetrum, the most dominant uh, shrub in Finnish Lapland. So, um, um, so one example how spatial modeling can be used. And probably what spatial modeling, especially species distribution models have been used most for is to compare niche of a species. And here is just one way to visualize, uh, visualize uh, uh, species niche. So what we have here is uh, four different species uh, and the x-axis and y-axis of this plot represent principal components of multiple uh, environmental predictors. So uh, environmental space consisting of temperature and uh, precipitation, soil quality, radiation, solar radiation and so on it's kind of the amount of variation there is minimized to two principal components. And the point cloud here shows the species occurrence in such environmental space. And alone, this cloud of uh, points doesn't really tell anything, but when we compare it among the species, we can see that the distribution of these different, of these four species, it vary in relation to these uh, environmental uh, variables. For example, the Drapa nor, nor Vechika has a, we could say, narrower uh, niche uh, according to, the, according to the, uh, the principal component one, whereas uh, Geranium sylvaticum has a wider, uh, wider niche. Uh, and finally, then, uh, what we can use once we have uh, quantified the relationship between the space between the phenomena that we are interested of and the underlying uh, underlying drivers. So by using that information, we can forecast uh, the phenomena of interest in space or in time. And what is here? Uh, uh, forecast or predicted is a change in uh, species richness when the cover of woody vegetation increases uh, in the Arctic environments uh, along with the climate change. One big environmental change is the uh, increase uh, of amount of woody vegetation, a phenomenon called uh, shrubification. It increases competition among uh, among Arctic plants, it also affects shading and uh, snow uh, trapping and uh, microclimatic conditions, and that in turn then influences uh, Arctic species. And here is our first uh, uh, trial to try to forecast how it can affect uh, the future distribution of uh, Arctic biodiversity. Uh, 
And what we see that uh, the doubling of woody vegetation or the doubling of current woody vegetation won't have a lot of influence on the species richness of vascular plants. But when it multiplies uh, by eight times, so we'll see uh, big decreases in the biodiversity of Arctic species, especially in the valleys in the, in the lowland uh, areas. But so spatial modeling can be used uh, for many things. And uh, so we would then like, uh, we would probably or most likely like, like to apply it for the for modeling soil microorganisms too. And uh, I took now species distribution model as an example, because that is probably the most known and most used uh, spatial model to assess biodiversity or, or some kind of ecological phenomena. And the idea is that I'll just uh, briefly go step by step what SDM means, and then I'll go in detail back to the different steps and make the, the comparisons between what we usually have done when we model plants and what then should be kind of reconsidered when modeling uh, soil microorganisms. Okay, but so to build an SDM, we first need data. And uh, since this is a spatial model, so it needs to be so-called spatially explicit data. So here, uh, this is a, a map. Uh, those who have been working in the Rechal study area or has uh, heard different presentations from, uh, from the group of Antoine uh, maybe uh, identifies this uh, study area. It looks a bit uh, weird here because it, uh, kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of a 3D representation. But we have here a map and it has some green dots and green dots represent those places where we have collected the information of the, of the ecological phenomena that we are interested in. In the case of SDM, it's usually the presences and absences of a species. And for all of those locations from where we collected the data, we need information of those environmental variables that we, based on ecological theory, think that drives the distribution of the species of a plant, for example, or of a microorganism. And, uh, and so uh, we need uh, data both on the, the phenomena that we are interested in and the, the underlying uh, drivers. And then based on that information, we build the model. We try to assess the relationship of uh, the the, the variable of interest and those that uh, are, are driving it. And here on the figure, uh, one can draw maximum three environmental variables, but actually mathematically, we could include as many environmental variables as possible. But the main idea is to identify the relationship of the, of the, the plant distribution or the soil microorganism distribution in relation to those uh, driving environmental variables. That can be basically as many as one wants, but uh, well, some constraints there are. And then once we make the prediction, if we want to make the prediction, sometimes one can finish the, the SDM here in the modeling step and one only wants to find out information from the model and not, not to make a prediction. But if we wish to make a prediction, we need information of those same environmental variables that we used. And we need those uh, usually in a spatial format. And based on that information and the model, we make the prediction of, uh, of species occurrence. And we can make that prediction uh, in the current time, or if we are interested in the possible future changes, for example, under the uh, changing climate or changing stratification conditions. So we can make the similar prediction, or we can use, I mean, we can use the same model, but the future versions of those, uh, of those predictors and, uh, and the predict the distribution of the species. And from those outputs, uh, prediction outputs, we can, for example, assess the change the taxa in time or in space. Uh, we can compare different taxa. We can compare different areas if we have made the predictions for multiple taxa, multiple areas, and that way identify the most vulnerable or, or risky uh, areas and uh, identify biodiversity hotspots or, or plant conservation access. <laughs> 
Uh, but so a bit in more detail what to consider in each step. So when we build, when we collect the data, the, the, uh, the data on our response variable, it's usually presences or in the best case, it's presences and absences. So we have locations where the species exist or and sometimes also where it don't exist. But we could also use abundance, uh, biomass, percentage cover, number of individuals. Uh, some people also say that it would be better to include uh, uh, some kind of approximation of a fitness, because if species is there, it doesn't necessarily tell anything if it, if it can reproduce there. And that's usually the, what, uh, what is a measure of, uh, of like a uh, measure of a niche if a, if a species can reproduce there. Or we could, using the same approach, we could, for example, model functional traits. Uh, and then, so we can have uh, the response variable can represent only one taxa, or it could be also number of species in a location or some kind of, some kind of other measure of a community. And the predictor variables, they should be causal. So one can find spatial correlations or spatial relationship among variables or among factors without there without any causality being there so we we are heavily relying on ecological theory to identify the causal um, and meaningful predictors and then i said that here in the model we can have basically as many like there are no in a way mathematical restrictions here in the picture there are only visual restrictions to have uh, more than three uh, predictors but the, the limit the number of environmental variables comes from the n of uh, of the study uh, number of the sample the size of the sample so if we have uh, only a few locations from where we have data we can only use uh, uh, very few uh, predictors and then other considerations when we are collecting the data, when we are deciding what data to use, is to uh, so we need to pay attention on a spatial scale. So how big of an area the study area covers, what kind of environmental conditions we cover, and also like from how big area we collect the data. Are we using like a one square meter plots or or twenty meters by twenty meters plots or uh, or maybe one square kilometer plots? And that affects what kind of interpretations we can draw from the from the results, and the same with the, the temporal scale. Okay. Well, for the modeling step, I won't go into the detail here, but to run the actual mathematical model, there is a plenty of different algorithms to use. The most typical probably being the generalized linear models or generalized additive models, and uh, or some other or some uh, machine learning methods. But the very crucial step when doing building the model is to evaluate it. So to test how well what we fit it or what the model fits or what the model predicts, how well that goes hand in hand with what was observed. And, uh, and there are multiple ways to do the model evaluation. And I come back to that when we are talking about soil microorganisms. And from this modeling step, one can identify the variable importance or compare the relative influence of different variables. Uh, one can get out the information of the responses between the, the response variable and the predictors, if the responses are positive, negative, or hump-shaped, or, or something else. And all of this, the modeling steps and the prediction steps, they can be done for single species, or if one is modeling and predicting multiple species, we can combine the results of single taxa to assess communities. And for example, combine the modeling steps or the, or the modeling outputs or the, the prediction outputs to represent Shannon diversity or the forecasted community changes, or one can make the comparison among the species, like see if there are variation. Um, among species groups, for example, whether the responses are, are negative or positive. Okay. But so plenty to consider. So uh, 
So one need to think, pay attention on when choosing the data or when parametricizing the model or, or when making the, the predictions. But for this talk, I have divided these uh, considerations to two parts. The first concerning uh, the, the uh, predictors. So identify and derive the justified predictors for the response variable. And then the second part, the two other considerations that one should make when parametricizing the model to fit the data. And not only to fit the data, but fit the research question too, so that one gets the, the actual uh, answer for the question. And as I said, so the SDMs are traditionally applied for above ground species and especially to quantify real life niche of plant species. I don't have the data here, but the, the, um, for one study, I ran a, a literature church in Easy Web of Science. And from the result, I checked that how many of the published SDMs concern plant species and how many, for example, mammals or birds or insects and so on. So plant species are way overrepresented uh, in the literature. And this also means that most of the data or most of the methods or the guidelines or the, or the examples that exist in the literature, so they concern a uh, plant species. And uh, then when one wants to, to model, or if one wants to model soil microorganisms, so there are certain things that one needs to, uh, to think. And now for the second, uh, or for the next part of the, the study, so I'll, uh, I want to tell about some experiences that I had first concerning uh, choosing the best predictors for modeling soil microorganisms and next uh, and next then other considerations that I needed to make or some other choices that I needed to take when uh, when uh, predicting soil microorganisms. Okay. And yeah, for many of the things I don't kind of have the, the ready answer so I don't have the correct data to provide or the correct method to tell that use this. So it's it will be more of a list of things to consider in case one ends up building a model for soil organisms, but also like if one is reading about spatial modeling of soil microorganisms, so what kind of things uh, uh, one should pay attention for the reliability or for the, for the interpretation of the results. Okay. So the first comparison between the plants and, uh, and the microorganisms. So for the plants, we know that uh, from the ecological theory quite well that the, the one of the most influential predictors of uh, plant distribution or plant occurrence are uh, temperature, uh, precipitation or moisture, solar radiation, and uh, soil properties here showcased by a warm because PowerPoint or Microsoft icon uh, variability didn't have a good one for soil quality. So a warm here now represents a different kind of a soil uh, properties. It can be nutrients, so it can be uh, uh, the, the grain size of uh, soil ingredients and that then reflecting the amount of nutrients or the, the water holding capacity or so on. But pretty much these four variables are central for all of the plants, no matter the ecosystem. But then there can, and there is, of course, other influential predictors. They can be pollinators or some kind of uh, other biotic interactions, uh, biotic interactions with fungi, mycorrhiza. Uh, uh, there are uh, different kinds of uh, regulators or disturbances. Fire, for example, in the snowy areas, avalanches can destroy uh, vegetation. Well, uh, fire and snow, they can be beneficial for some species too, but uh, probably for the most of the, the, well, not sure of the most, but for many of the species. So they, are, they uh, mean some kind of a disturbance and there can be herbivores, different types uh, here, a, a tiny insect, but, uh, but also a, a bigger herbivores can affect the distribution of the species or occurrence of the species. But we quite well know what drives the distribution of, uh, of, uh, of plant species. And that way it is easy, or one would think that it's at least easy to choose the right predictors to build, build a model, to build a SDM for a plant. 
But then when we take a microorganism, so we know, we know, but we know probably less, or at least that's what I would say that we know less. We know that there are some regulators, temperature for sure affects somehow the metabolism of, uh, of different microorganisms. Moisture as a resource for sure, soil nutrients or different resources affect their distribution. We know that especially pH shows in many uh, research as a super influential, especially for soil bacteria. Uh, but there might be some others too, and we know those, uh, but, uh, but it's not at least as we know some of them, but it, not, it is not as well known at, and as well researched in modeling literature as it, as it is for plants. And well, so I said that we know for the plants quite well what to use or what should be used, and one should assume that this is the case, but well, it is not. So here's another uh, literature research, or how is it called, the meta-analysis, uh, not meta-analysis, well, quantitative uh, literature uh, research, where uh, we identified all the plant SDM studies published by 2015 at that time, and we checked that what variables are being uh, used when building SDMs. And what we found that, yes, most of them have temperature and moisture, uh, but the soil and lights that we know that they affect you, they were way underrepresented and very rarely biotic uh, interactions, disturbances and land use uh, were used. And topography was quite often there, but topography is no direct uh, uh, driver of plants. It's a topography indirectly affects temperature and uh, precipitation, maybe some soil properties and, and so on. So, Despite all the information, so why were not the ecologically sound or ecologically justified predictors included with the plants? And probably the most obvious reason is that the data is not available, and especially the spatial layers uh, or the future scenarios are lacking for soil light uh, disturbance and, uh, and the land use uh, predictors. So people tend to use what is available maybe, uh, rather than, uh, rather than uh, 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 what should be used. Um, and well, it's quite natural. So not all like uh, if we want to build a model, so we might not have time or, um, or, or resources to, get, uh, to go and collect by ourselves the data. But uh, why temperature and moisture is so frequently used is that they are so frequently available. Uh, there is high resolution data uh, freely available for the, for, with, the global, with the global extent, so for the, all of the world. And, uh, and obviously that is then used and uh, IPCC providing the future scenarios. So it's quite easy or, or if not simple, but easy or straightforward to build a, a model for a plant species uh, when using only uh, climate variables and maybe something with the topography. And this was at least the case like 2016, 17. Now I, when I did some further researching, so I know this that the United Nations, uh, what it's a food and agriculture organization, FAO, so they have started to build a harmonized uh, world soil database, providing some soil variables, which then probably will feed the spatial modeling of future forecasts of, uh, of uh, biodiversity. But so, in the study that we did uh, in Lausanne together with uh, Antoine, Antoine Kisan and, uh, and others in the group then, so we tested that how well these available uh, climate and topography variables can actually uh, explain distribution of different uh, taxonomic groups. And here on the y-axis or in this graph, uh, so what it shows is the model performance, how well climatic and topographic variables can explain distribution of different species groups. And those species groups that we tested were amphibians, reptiles, grasshoppers, butterflies, bumblebees, plants, uh, and uh, microorganisms, fungi, soil bacteria, and protists. And the measure that is used here is AUC, ranging from 0 0.5 to 1, and 0 0.5 meaning that the model doesn't do any better than the random, uh, random uh, uh, re representation, and one meaning that it uh, 
models perfectly. And with climatic and topographic variables, we can quite okay-ish uh, model a distribution of especially grasshoppers, amphibian, uh, reptiles, uh, uh, butterflies, and plants. But the whole group of microorganisms, all the three groups of microorganisms, so the models performed very poorly. So uh, if we wanted to use only the available data to model soil microorganisms, we wouldn't go very far. So, uh, so when building a SDM or any kind of spatial model for uh, soil microorganisms, so we need to pay attention for the data availability or be aware that, that not necessarily all the data that we want to use or we should use, it might not be available. Uh, well, in the next study, we only took, uh, oh, and the previous uh, study was from the Alpine uh, environment. That's why the picture from the, from the apps. So in the same study, after well kind of we knew already before starting to do the previous study that we won't go very far with only climatic and topographic variables so and we knew from the previous uh, research that its soil properties for sure uh, will influence uh, soil bacteria so this time we took soil predictors uh, in addition to climatic uh, uh, predictors climatic variables uh, and, and topographic variables, and we tested how well different these different predictors explain abundance of albine soil bacteria taxa. And what we found now on the y-axis is the relative importance of nine different uh, variables in a model. So we compared only these nine. Uh, but what we found among these nine is that the pH had by far the best explanatory power. Uh, and here are the other ones. Uh, this one is the total organic carbon. Uh, again, PowerPoint didn't have a very good icon for that. Uh, temper winter temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, topography, uh, clay slope, and uh, temperature range. But among these nine, the pH would be the only one uh, influencing uh, 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 Alpine so bacteria abundance, and but it's uh, so uh, so from this we could then based on this model we could then say that okay it's only the pH that matters that why to concentrate on any other uh, predictors or any other environmental variables since it's only pH that can explain by far most of the the varia variation that there is, but. It's since we know from the other research that, that there are other influential predictors. So probably we don't have, it doesn't mean that the temperature wouldn't affect, but the type of the temperature variable that we used won't uh, have effect. And uh, actually, since we are looking at the soil microorganisms, so we can assume that there's something in the soil that affects them. And here, this is a, a graph from the, from the research done by my colleague in Helsinki. So they compared uh, the air temperature and soil temperature in the same locations. And uh, what they found is that instead of such one-to-one -one relationships, like that, the, that there is linear relationship between the air temperature and soil temperature, they found that, the, that uh, when the air temperature is below zero uh, Celsius degrees, so the soil temperature, how, how can I know? So there is a higher deviance from the one-to-one -one line when we go to sub-zero temperatures. So what this means, ecologically speaking, is that the, the temperature, what, what we experience above ground is not the same as we experience uh, below ground, especially when the air temperature is below zero uh, degrees. And, this study, I need to tell you that this study is from the Arctic. Well, that's why there are temperatures below uh, zero degrees, but it's the snow cover mostly that affects the, the, air uh, the soil temperature and depending also some other soil uh, properties, whether there is a lot of organic material that can warm up the, the ground temperature and so on. So most likely it's not the air temperature that affects the soil microorganisms, but it's the soil temperature. But now the next problem is that where do we get the soil temperature data? 
And that kind of didn't exist back in the time, but now there is uh, Jonas Lembrechts uh, has started this project of, uh, of uh, soil temp uh, data. So we are getting toward a global database of, uh, of microclimate. And uh, this will most likely help and uh, assist in modeling or choosing the right predictors, uh, choosing the right temperature predictors for, uh, for soil microorganisms. The same concern for the moisture, like it's quite weird that the, the, the pre, uh, that water wouldn't affect soil microorganisms at all because it's an important resource for those. So here, this is my co also colleague from Helsinki, Julia Kempinen, who has studied uh, soil moisture. And uh, here is a study area also in Arctic Finland, uh, two kilometers by one and a half kilometers, and she measured uh, soil moisture with the soil moisture um, <laughs> measurement, uh, uh, what is called uh, the measured soil moisture as a volumetric water content. And uh, if we look at this two kilometers by one and a half kilometers area, we can assume that the precipitation is exactly the same there. But uh, we see that the soil moisture is very much uh, uh, different. So there is a huge variance in, uh, in uh, soil moisture from 5% even to 80%. And, uh, and uh, so if we would use the precipitation, for example, annual precipitation or growing season precipitation to model soil microorganisms, that probably won't represent the experience moisture conditions in that location. So again, uh, soil moisture is something uh, if we had that data, so it probably would then uh, assist in building better models for soil microorganisms. Now I did something with my screen here. Okay, hopefully now I get further. And without going too much into detail, so other thing that uh, Julia found in this research is that the soil moisture was best predicted by a topographic variable expressing soil wetness and the topographic variable that was built using the LIDAR data. And the LIDAR data is a light detection and range, uh, 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 range uh, comes from the light detection and range uh, and ranging. And it's a kind of a radar that uh, builds a topography with a super fine detail. And, uh, and uh, with the LiDAR data, we could probably get the better topography data and that way also a better representation of, uh, of uh, soil uh, moisture. I see that the time is flying and I'm only, only getting to the, uh, to the fourth part of the, uh, but I have still five, 10 minutes maybe. Okay. But so as a reply to the first part, so when choosing uh, the, the predictors, to model soil microorganisms. So we need to think the ecology, so the influential predictors, but not only the predictors themselves, but also the spatial resolution so that we have fine enough uh, data that actually represent the conditions that the soil microorganisms uh, experience. Uh, but the, the right resolution is also, it depends on the, the response variable. So if the soil microorganisms are collected from a multiple places from one square kilometer area, then uh, precipitation might uh, be a good, uh, good uh, predictor for those. But uh, if not so, if the, if the response variable represents something smaller spatial units, so then we also need the predictors to represent the finer spatial units. And probably it's the soil variables and the soil microclimate instead of the, the air temperature. Okay. But to the second part and uh, how to para and what other things to take into account when building a model for, uh, for a soil microorganisms. So first, the response variable. And I again make the comparison to the plants. So if we are modeling a plant, so when we are collecting the information from the plants on the field, for example, they are easy to observe, they don't run away, and we can identify visually the species occurrence. We can determine that it is there or it is not there. And in that sense, we are modeling a presences and absences or something alike, for example, a percentage cover, if that's what we have identified but pretty easy. And then what we are then predicting 
So this is a mathematical detail, but uh, even though we are modeling presences and absences, so what we are predicting is a probability of occurrence. But that prediction is uh, made based on the environmental niche that we quantified in the first step, based on the data and based on the model. And this is now with the very light color there uh, written. It says that, of course, it's possible to miss a species. This is called detection problem in, uh, in SDM uh, literature. But uh, usually we think that we have at least, uh, we have quite big certainty uh, whether we have observed or not a plant. For animals, there is a bit of a, the, the detection problem is uh, uh, bigger because maybe the species was there or it occurs there, but not exactly that side, the exact time point that uh, we are making the observation. But it's quite easy to quantify the species niche of a plant, but the case microorganisms. So it is not easy to observe or identify visually. We need to go to the laboratory. Uh, well, for the plants, we model species and we think that a species has an environmental niche, but when we are modeling microorganisms, so we don't even kind of know what is a species. So the thing that we then, the unit of a, of a microorganism that we have, so does it have uh, in, in an environmental niche? So what is it that we are determining uh, and modeling and predicting, if not a uh, niche of a species? And so usually the microorganisms are identified based on, uh, on a DNA sequencing, and there is a plenty of uh, research uh, and literature concerning the, the best laboratory and bioinformatic pipeline, but I won't go into those here. I just uh, will comment on a few things that can be fixed by modeling. But so instead of modeling and predicting species occurrence, we have usually something called observational taxonomic unit and count of sequences per OTU. And then the question is that the does a count of sequences have an, uh, does a count of sequences of an OTU have a niche? So if the idea is to model a niche and then predict that in, in space and time, so we need to uh, check kind of the ecological assumptions uh, when building the model. And then the big question when we are building the models and comparing different taxa and comparing different uh, regions is that did we detect all the OTUs with same precision, precision at all samples? So if we get 100 counts of OTU1 and 100 counts of OTU2, does it mean that the, the OTU2, number two, uh, occurred twice as much? Or maybe the, the OTU represents a big an organism, and that's why there is more DNA uh, in the sample or something. And it could be also that when we compare the sample A and sample B, so if they come from the very different uh, soil properties, or if, if it would be an aquatic environment, if the, the water qualities are very different, so it might be that, that something in the lab or something in the bioinformatic pipelines does that it's easier to extract DNA from certain type of soil than, than from the other one. So how do we compare these? So in the modeling step, so first of all, when we are modeling the counts of OTUs, we need to choose a suitable error distribution. So when we are modeling presences and absences, we use a binomial model, but now that we are modeling counts, so we need to use a, a, a model that fits, suits for a count data, for example, a Poisson or a, or a negative binomial. Uh, then we need to choose a suitable modeling algorithm, and these modeling algorithms are, for example, GLM or uh, uh, generalized linear models or generalized additive models. And uh, I won't go into the detail, but some of them, uh, when they fit the data, they do it that with more detail. Here, for example, if we look at the response curve of a GPM, how this, whatever we have modeled, how it, we look at its relationship to, 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 to total organic carbon. So we see that the GPM has fitted a much more uh, fine scale variance uh, along the, the gradient, whereas uh, the generalized additive model has not done so much. So depending if we want to get a super good explanation, we might want to use the GPM, but if we want to use, uh, if we want to get a more generalized view, so we might want to use, uh, yeah. Uh, then 
the evaluation step is an important one. Usually when we are modeling plants and their occurrence, presences and absences, there's plenty of evaluation metrics that can be used and that are based on presences and absences, AUC, TSS, kappa, sensitivity, specificity. So one makes the two times two contingency table and compare how many presences were predicted right, how many absences were predicted right, and how many absences of presence were, pre were predicted wrong. But now that we are predicting counts, we cannot use the same metric or the same evaluation metrics. So what we usually use is just we correlate the observed abundances or the observed counts to those that we fitted, fitted or predicted. And then the big question that, that how can we compare counts of OTUs across taxa or across samples. And there I don't have, uh, unfortunately, a very good reply. But the few things that when I did run this model, so the few things that we can do or take, how we can take some of that into account in the model, in the modeling step, is first uh, that instead of using the usual closed reference or not usual, the, the traditional closed referencing so that we have a reference database of sequences and then we compare the sequences that we found to the reference database and every time we have a match we mark that as a as a one uh, we can count that as a as a match but in the de novo we don't use any kind of a reference database but uh, we take we just when to sequence when the sequences are different enough to our opinion to, to some threshold that we've chosen so we say that there are different kind of taxa and here in this figure with a lot of uh, vertical bars or vertical a lot of boxes so dn refers to de novo and cr to close reference and when using the de novo uh, pipeline, we got a little bit better model performance metrics than when using the CR. So when building the spatial models, so we, it seems that we get some kind of a better representation of what is there when using the de novo uh, pipeline. And then other thing and more related to modeling, this de novo and close reference is more related to data preparation. But then uh, the typical thing to do is a normalization when, uh, when, um, when uh, preparing the data. So that to take into account the variance among samples in, in counts of uh, OTUs. So uh, we tested, uh, uh, we tested to include a thing called offset term in the models. And it's uh, these three first uh, box plot uh, boxes here. And again, we see that the, using the offset term uh, a little bit outperforms the, the, normaliz the, the normalization step or the data uh, models based on a normalization uh, step. So something that can be uh, accounted for or something that can be used in the modeling step. Well, the one last minute, I know I'm already over time, but the, so the last step when building the models is the prediction in space or time. And the, well, now we basically have it all. We have the data, we have to model and to make the prediction in space or time, we only need the, the environmental layers. And um, that doesn't really differ from uh, predicting plants. Uh, so we need uh, spatial layers of uh, soil properties or, and or we need the future scenarios of soil properties if those are the, the, the factors that we identified as influential for our uh, OTUs or for our soil microorganisms. And um, for plants, it's a, a bit of a, a bit more easier because we have the spatial representations and we have the spatial representations of future scenarios because plant species are so frequently modeled or the climatic uh, data is needed for something else too. But basically, those are based on uh, on a similar spatial model as uh, as modeling, for example, plants or soil microorganisms. There is a point type data of climatic conditions. And using different interpolation techniques or different modeling techniques, 
uh, those are modeled uh, as a spatial representation of climate. So basically, same can be due for the soil properties. If we have point type information of soil, we can using uh, interpolations or uh, or spatial modeling or those two together, we can create the spatial uh, 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 models. And then for the future versions, so same as for climate. For climate, we have looked back into history and checked how the climatic conditions have changed. And then based on that and the knowledge what changes climate to the, the emissions to atmosphere, using that information, uh, climate scientists have predicted uh, or created the future scenarios of climate. So basically using the similar uh, approaches, we can create information of future conditions of uh, pH or, uh, or uh, organic carbon or, uh, or whatever we identified as influential predictors. And here just uh, super simply of Colleen Alimburi from uh, Lausanne. Uh, uh, so she had data of soil pH from 1970 and 2016, uh, we checked the difference uh, or the trend, it's in principle pretty much an increasing uh, trend in pH. Uh, we identified the drivers that uh, the uh, anthropogenic drivers that, or we knew the anthropogenic drivers that causes the acidification, uh, the increase of uh, pH. And we uh, assumed that, that what if the, the trends or the human actions continue as usual and the pH continues increasing? Or what if the humans changes their behavior and, uh, and the pH starts decreasing? So, uh, and created the scenarios based on that. And using those scenarios, there are plenty of, uh, of plots now, but using those scenarios and, uh, and, uh, and the models uh, for soil bacteria, we made the predictions the future or the, the imaginary future under the scenarios of the PhD uh, decreasing or increasing and same uh, for the organic carbon. Okay. But so take home messages. Um, so spatial modeling is uh, used to quantify relationships among different variables. For example, SDMs are used to model and predict a niche of a taxon. And it's always the research question and the response variable that guides the choice of uh, environmental variables and the model parametrization and evaluation. And uh, when, whenever one is choosing something, so one should pay attention to ecological soundness uh, of the model and, and the choices. Okay, thank you for your attention and sorry for the overtime. <laughs> it's okay, thank you so much, Heidi. Uh, it was really